One number kept constantly running through the thoughts of Detroit automaker Hugh Chalmers during the early months of 1910. It had been two years since he purchased the Thomas Detroit Motor Company and renamed it the Chalmers Motor Company. During that time, the firm had released two impressive vehicles boasting names designed to resonate with the many Americans who still had vivid memories of the horse and buggy years. The engine of one of those automobiles provided drivers with the equivalent of the power of 30 horses. So it was christened the Chalmers Model 30. As for the Model 40, its engine offered consumers, you guessed it, a remarkable 40 horsepower. Despite these triumphs, the number that Hugh Chalmers could not get out of his mind was neither 30 nor 40. It was 950. His Model 30, you see, retailed for around $1,500, and the Model 40 for a hefty $2,750. But across town, Henry Ford's new 20-horsepower Model T was priced at a jaw-dropping $950. Chalmers remained convinced that the extra power and added amenities meant that his automobiles were worth every penny. But with the Model T the talk of the nation, he needed to find a way to get Americans to take notice. So he pitched an idea to the National Commission, baseball's governing body, before the creation of the commissioner's office. The automaker told the commission that he was prepared to reward both the American and the National League batting champions with a Chalmers Model 30. With the automobile still a thrilling new entry onto the scene, the novelty contest created plenty of public interest. But there was good reason to be skeptical that either league would feature a close race. After all, Pirates great Hannes Wagner had captured four consecutive National League batting crowns and six of the last seven, many of them by commanding margins. In the American League, Detroit's 23-year-old wonderkin Ty Cobb looked to be an even more prohibitive favorite, having run away with three straight batting titles. Yet, as it turned out, there was no shortage of suspense. In the National League, Giants rookie Fred Snodgrass led for much of the season until a September slump threw the race into chaos. Wagner then rebounded from a slow start and surged into contention, but could not quite catch Philly slugger Sherwood McGee, who ended with a 331 average. Indeed, the drama lingered even after McGee's season ended as implausible challenger Arthur Solly Hoffman of the Cubs, a 261 career hitter going into the season, still had three more games to overtake McGee. There was still more excitement in the American League, where Cobb was receiving a stiff challenge from Cleveland's Nap Lajouet. Although Lajouet had captured the American League batting title in 1901, 1903, and 1904, Few had expected him to contend in 1910. When he became the team's player manager in 1905, the change led sports writers and fans to refer to the team as the Naps. But the new responsibilities took a toll on his hitting. During the 1909 season, however, Lajouet relinquished the managerial reins. And by the following summer, it was clear that the 35-year-old had been rejuvenated. I was unhappy almost all the time while managing, he confided to a reporter. Look at me now. I'm the happiest of mortals with a good chance of winning an automobile. All of this meant that as the 1910 season entered its final week, with both pat races long since decided, the cars offered by Hugh Chalmers were the focus of attention. Complicating matters, however, was the reality that a metric like batting average was significantly more difficult to determine than a simple counting statistic. While a list of the batting leaders was published in almost every major newspaper, those figures were typically based upon the calculations of staff members, while the official statistics were maintained at the headquarters of the respective leagues. The result was widespread uncertainty about the status of both batting races. On the eve of the final weekend, the American League released official statistics showing that Cobb, in fact, held a six-point lead over Lajouet. 
As it happened, Cobb had already been invited to take part in an exhibition series in Philadelphia to prepare the pennant winning athletics for the World Series. Upon learning that he held an apparently comfortable lead in the batting race, Cobb opted to accept the invitation and skip the season's final two games, leaving Lajue with little chance to catch him. After a summer of unpredictable twists and turns, it was beginning to look inevitable that Cobb and McGee would claim their respective league crowns. Instead, one last surprise lay ahead. In the National League, the upstart Hoffman was unable to collect enough hits to overtake McGee. Yet in an ending that seemed too good to be true, Lajway reeled off eight hits in a doubleheader against the St. Louis Browns. The baseball world reacted in disbelief. Lajway had shockingly won the race after all. Or had he? The race was once again so close that nobody was entirely sure who had earned the automobile. Alas, while fans all across the country were pulling out pencil and paper to try to figure out the actual winner, word spread that Lajue's barrage of hits had indeed been too good to be true. With Brown's rookie third baseman, Red Corridan, stationed far back of the base, six of Lajue's eight hits came on bunts into the vacated area, while another was said to have been a routine fly ball that somehow landed untouched between two Browns outfielders. An investigation established that Corridan had been acting on instructions from manager Jack O'Connor and coach Harry Howell, so he was not punished. Both O'Connor and Howell, however, were fired by the Browns. And while they were not officially banned, neither man ever again held a major league job. American League President Van Johnson then announced that Despite Lajue's final day windfall, Cobb had nosed him out by percentage points to claim the coveted title. Years later, however, a careful audit revealed that Lajue should have been declared the winner as clerical errors had been made in Cobb's favor. That in turn raised another knotty question. Were those errors honest mistakes or were they intentional alterations designed to deflect attention away from the embarrassing escapades in St. Louis. For the purposes of the coveted Chalmers Model 30, that question was moot because Hugh Chalmers decided to present a car to both players. It's a fascinating saga for a number of reasons, one of which is that, just like the automobile, statistics such as batting average were still new enough to be tinged with considerable glamour. Today, although there are complaints about the impenetrability of some of the new analytic measures, we take the batting average for granted. Yet this three decimal point statistic is a far from simple concept since it relies upon compiling painstaking records and then using long division, a technique that few were acquainted with when the batting race between Cobb and Lajue reached its controversial conclusion. For much of the 19th century, you see, numbers played little, if any, role in the lives of many Americans. Barter remained widespread in rural areas, and when currency was used, the amounts were expressed in whole numbers and were kept as simple as possible. With many Americans unaccustomed to manipulating numbers, a common ploy of con artists of the era was simply to present an unfamiliar bill and ask a storekeeper to make change for them. Moreover, even those who did feel fairly comfortable with addition and subtraction were far less so when it came to division, particularly when they yielded the unfamiliar decimal points. The sporting world in particular was a bastion of traditionalism. Measurement of time or distance was rarely a part of athletic competitions prior to the mid 19th century nor would precise record keeping have been practical for events that were often adjusted due to the idiosyncrasies of the site. Besides, it was so much more fun to arrange a greased pole or slippery pig competition than to worry about whether the distance of a particular race matched that of the previous year. 
Standard measurements gradually began to assume a larger role in track and field competitions, but there seemed to be no compelling need to introduce complicated statistics into bat and ball sports. During baseball's early years, spectators often track the score by simply making notches on a stick. In fact, the word score comes from the very act of scoring such notches. As for individual statistics, they were based largely on those of cricket, in which there is a straightforward relationship between runs and hits. A cricket batsman who hits the ball can elect not to run, but if he does so, there are only two possible outcomes. He makes his way safely between the wickets, scoring a run or runs, or he is dismissed, which is cricket terminology for put out. So in order to get a good sense of a cricket batsman's aptitude, you just compare the number of runs to the number of dismissals. This required division, of course, but the troublesome decimal points were avoided by means of a method known as average and over. The average of a player who scored 10 runs with three dismissals was said to be three and one. Three runs every time he bats, with one left over. In short then, cricket lacks the concept of a hit because it isn't necessary. In baseball, however, hits and runs are not synonymous and the difference is crucial. A player can collect a base hit but be left on base without scoring. As a result, evaluating the skill of a baseball batter is, in general, more difficult than doing so for a cricket batsman. After all, if a baseball team scores a run on three consecutive singles, it makes no sense to give all the credit for that run to the player who crossed the plate while ignoring the contributions of the two teammates. During the 1860s, however, this consideration seemed minor. To understand why, let's look at the batting statistics compiled by George Wright of the Red Stockings of Cincinnati during that club's historic undefeated season of 1869. As reported at the time, Wright had 304 hits in 483 at bats for a 629 batting average, 49 home runs, zero strikeouts. Wow. The most obvious conclusion to be drawn from those numbers is that George Wright was an outstanding hitter, and indeed he was. Many authorities consider him to be that decade's greatest player and he has a plaque in the Baseball Hall of Fame. But George Wright's numbers also serve as a vivid reminder that a statistical record cannot be used for the purpose of comparison without understanding the context in which it was compiled. In his case, with pitchers limited to underhand deliveries, fielders lacking gloves, and a rubbery ball the norm, recording outs was very difficult work. And clubs commonly ran up 70 or more runs in a game. As a result, every regular on the Red Stockings that year batted at least 450, including pitcher Asa Brainerd, whose very name is the likely origin of the term pitching ace. In that context, Wright's team leading 629 average remains impressive, but no longer quite so eye popping. It is a similar story with Wright's seemingly incomprehensible total of zero strikeouts. Given the limitations on pitching delivery, strikeouts were rare and were even a bit of an embarrassment for an accomplished batter. As a team, the Red Stocking struck out only eight times all season. Finally, we come to George Wright's 49 home runs. That figure is significantly higher than the home run totals of most of his teammates. But here a different consideration must be borne in mind. Although Wright was unquestionably a great home run hitter, even in the context of the era, the difference between the value of a home run and a shorter base hit was far less than it is today. Nowadays, base runners score about one third of the time, which puts a premium on home runs. By contrast, the 1869 season saw George Wright cross the plate 339 times while being left on base at innings end only 28 times, a scoring rate well over 90%. In that environment, while a home run was certainly advantageous, a player who made a shorter hit was nearly as likely to score 
explaining why baseball adopted crickets, average, and over. This approach was obviously imperfect, since batters on strong teams typically get more chances to bat, as do hitters at the top of the order. So too, a player is more likely to score if followed in the order by stellar hitters. Nonetheless, average and over was an easily calculated metric that gave a reasonable approximation of batting skill. If you compare the batting averages of the members of the 1869 Red Stockings to the runs per game of each player, they correspond very closely. As a result, most knowledgeable observers considered average and over more than adequate for measuring batting proficiency, but not English-born sports writer Henry Chadwick. Chadwick's much older half-brother, Sir Edwin Chadwick, had earned renown by pioneering the use of statistical analysis in the public health field. The elder Chadwick collected data about the location and conditions of various epidemics. Then he compared the death rates to help to pinpoint the cause. When Sir Edwin's methodology identified the need for significant sanitation reforms, it laid the foundations for the science of epidemiology. Henry Chadwick applied similar reasoning to the much less weighty issue of batting proficiency. Having entered journalism as a cricket reporter, he was among the first to recognize that runs scored was not a great way to judge a baseball player's contribution. In 1864, with scoring at its peak, he wrote in his often overwrought prose style that when batting statistics were scrutinized closely, Many a dashing general player who carries off a great deal of eclat in prominent matches has all the guilt taken off the gingerbread. And we are frequently surprised to find that the modest but efficient worker who has played earnestly and steadily through the season, apparently unnoticed, has come in at the close of the race, the real victor. Four years later, he maintained that there is but one true criterion of skill at the bat and that is the number of times bases are made on clean hits. Initially, even those who recognized the merits of Chadwick's contention wondered whether the increased accuracy justified all the bother. Keeping track of base hits, after all, required a lot more work than making notches on a stick. In 1870, however, a desire to better balance offense and defense led many clubs to adopt a much less lively baseball known as the dead ball. The increased use of the dead ball caused run scoring to plummet, creating the need for new terms and new statistics. When zeros unexpectedly began to appear on the blackboards that had started to function as scoreboards, their shape was memorialized by referring to runless innings as goose eggs. And what about failing to score a run for an entire game? That remained such a rare occurrence that when a high-salaried Chicago team posted nine straight goose eggs in July 1870, the terms Chicago and Chicago defeats entered baseball parlance for what eventually became known as shutouts. Use of the dead ball had an even more transformative effect on the statistical measurement of baseball. With the team struggling to avoid Chicago defeats, the wisdom of Henry Chadwick's recommendation became obvious, and hits replaced runs scored as the standard measure of hitting proficiency. As part of the quest for greater accuracy, within a few years it became customary to divide the number of hits by the number of at-bats rather than the number of games, while the imprecise average and over method was also replaced with a figure calculated to three decimal places. The batting average had been born. Baseball box scores also changed dramatically. In the game's early years, it had been common to provide only a line score, along with the runs and outs for each batter. But during the 1870s, additional categories such as hits and at-bats became increasingly common. So newspapers went still further by appending a wide array of tidbits of information, such as extra base hits, 
Details on the work of the pitchers and fielders, the umpire's name, attendance, time, and assorted other minutia. The noted baseball writer Bill James unearthed an 1877 box score that included this gem, Apologies for Hitting Batsman, Morgan 4, Neal 3. Creating these expanded box scores required considerably more work, which raised questions about whether all that labor was worthwhile. In 1876, a reporter commented derisively that the present system of scoring seems rather a pretext for practicing bookkeeping by double, treble, or quadruple entry in the open air. That comparison of baseball scorekeeping to bookkeeping proved very apt. Just as the debits and credits must always balance one another out in accounting, so too baseball statistics came to be based on the principle of charging the results of each at bat to both batter and pitcher. For that matter, if the ball was hit to a fielder, the fielder's record was either credited with a chance accepted or charged with an error. In that way, the guilt could be taken off the gingerbread of an undeserving player and appropriate credit given to a less flashy player. The wealth of data thus created led to numerous new statistical measures, some of which made little sense. In 1880, for example, the National League tracked bases run, a cricket-based statistic that credited three bases run to a player stranded on third base at innings end. The flaw in this statistic was, of course, that in baseball, there was no inherent value to just reaching third base. So the ill-conceived category was abandoned after that season. One of the first awards offered on the basis of individual statistics was also insufficiently thought out. In 1879, James McKay of Buffalo offered a solid gold five by two inch medal to the National League player who had the best total after adding their fielding average to their batting average. McKay explained that he hoped to induce the heavy batters to look more to their fielding averages and the fine fielders to do something in the way of hitting. Unfortunately, as soon became evident, first basemen typically had the highest fielding averages, leaving players at other positions with little chance of winning. As a result, the criteria for the McKay medal were revised. Miscalculations were another common problem. In an extreme example, Cap Anson was declared the winner of the National League batting title following the 1879 season with an impressive 407 batting average. Yet subsequent reexaminations revealed that he actually only batted 317 that year. So instead of drawing attention to an underappreciated performer, all of this record keeping actually served to take the guilt off the gingerbread of the player who deserved the title, Paul Hines. A more fundamental problem with this emphasis on statistical records was that, as one reporter put it in 1878, it encouraged professionals to play for themselves and their records rather than for their clubs. When complaints of this nature became increasingly commonplace during the 1880s, the term record player entered the baseball vocabulary to designate a ball player who seemed obsessed with his own statistical record. Players even began sniping at official scores when a ruling damaged their numbers. These developments were very distressing to the likes of James McKay, who sought to use individual statistics to encourage all-around play and Henry Chadwick, who believed they would reveal the performer who had played earnestly and steadily through the season. Chadwick indeed became so concerned that the man who had once championed the base hit as the one true criterion of skill at the bat, eventually maintained instead that a batter's proficiency was shown by the number of base hits he makes, which forward runners, not by the figures of his base hit percentage. Despite all such shortcomings and second thoughts, too many had become accustomed to gauging batting proficiency by means of the statistical record in general and by batting average in particular for there to be any question of turning back. 
In the years that followed, the meticulous record keepers dubbed figure filberts compiled and arranged an enormous quantity of data. And by the 20th century, some very significant benefits were becoming apparent. Perhaps the most obvious was that, in order to keep pace, reporters and fans had to become far more adept at juggling numbers, a trend that neatly complemented their increased importance in all aspects of American society. In particular, kids accustomed to yawning through their math classes and questioning the subject's relevance to their lives began to rattle off the statistics of their favorite players and teams. Eventually, the backs of the baseball cards that youngsters flipped and traded became covered with an array of numbers that would once have been met with incomprehension. Although this was a sneaky way to get kids to do their math homework, when it worked, no complaints were heard. A subtler advantage, but one that was just as significant, was that all the data, or dope as it was often called, began to infuse meaning into games in which nothing appeared to be at stake. The lack of accurate record keeping in the 19th century had meant that it was rarely possible to celebrate when a career, season, or single game record was broken or a milestone reached. Indeed, it was hard to do more than guess as to whether an accomplishment was common or unusual. For a perfect illustration of just how much that changed, we need look no further than the 1910 games in which Lajway banged out his dubious eight hits. On the season's final day, with both pennant races long since decided, a doubleheader between second division teams would have once garnered little interest even among diehards. But thanks entirely to the tight race for superiority in an abstract and far from intuitive statistical category, that game became the talk of the baseball world. Career milestones also began to lend suspense to games between also rans. During the summer of 1910, attention was briefly drawn away from the two batting races when Lajoie's Cleveland teammate Cy Young reached the threshold of an unprecedented 500 career wins. On July 19th, Young pursued the milestone victory against the lowly Washington Senators and surrendered only one hit through eight brilliant innings, yet Cleveland trailed one to nothing. In the top of the ninth, his teammates rallied for two runs, putting Young within three outs of the milestone. But he faltered in the bottom half, allowing the Senators to tie the game and load the bases before wiggling out of the jam. At last, Cleveland pushed across three runs in the 11th, and when Young recorded the final out, he had earned win number 500. The win meant so much to the 43-year-old pitcher that he kept a game ball in order to commemorate the landmark victory. One reporter described the accomplishment as a unique feat requiring 21 years of continuous effort, which has no parallel in baseball annals and may never be repeated by any pitcher now before the public, with the possible exception of the illustrious Christy Mathewson. As that last comment suggests, one of the most stimulating consequences of a rigorously maintained statistical record is that it spawns no end of permutations. Naturally, it is not an everyday occurrence to see a record set or a significant milestone reached. To this day, Cy Young is the 500 win club's lone member. Yet whenever a record is set, it creates speculation about when it will be surpassed or whether it will prove to be one of those rare, unbreakable records spoken of in hushed tones. That became even more true thanks to increased attention paid to such achievements as no hitters and streaks. As a rule, anticipation over records and milestones builds gradually over time. But no matter how downtrodden the teams, fans enter the ballpark for every game, knowing that they might witness a bid for a no-hitter or an innocuous base hit that launches an historic streak. In the process, a seemingly meaningless game can be transformed into high drama. Perhaps the baseball or the bat in question will even be displayed at the Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. And what of Hugh Chalmers? He certainly had no reason to regret the award he had offered, 
as it had created far more publicity for the Chalmers Model 30 than he could have ever anticipated. In the months that followed, ads boasted that the car maker could not keep up with demand. In light of the season's controversial ending, however, Chalmers changed the criteria for the award. For the next four seasons, he instead offered an automobile to the player in each league, voted most valuable by a panel of sports writers. After the 1914 season, Hugh Chalmers discontinued the award entirely. Thanks to mass production techniques, the price of Henry Ford's Model T had dropped to $500 and even lower, making it increasingly difficult for Chalmers to compete. Some numbers stand by themselves, and 500, whether car prices or pitching victories are being measured, is just such a figure. Hello everybody, this is Donald Blomdahl, Hall of Fame, Veteran Sports Cards and Collectibles. Having been live to you from Arlington, Washington, we are going to continue on after our lecture has completed now. Baseball becomes a game of numbers. We're going to have some family mail call fun. I got a package from Kevin's Card Collecting right here. And then we'll open up a top stadium club box. Then we'll go back. To family mail call and open up Bibby's uh, part 8 of 12. Couldn't fit it all in the description. I ran out of room on the description there. You only get 100 characters. So we'll open up Bibby's part 8 of 12. And then to finish off the stream today, we're going to open up my second box of Super 70 Sports Baseball cards. One pack of cards with 20 cards per pack. Seeing if we can find another autograph. We found an autograph in yesterday's stream. So we are going to have fun now. Bibby says, got cinnamon rolls baking now. That sounds good there, Bibby. I should come on out to Georgia and join you for a coffee and a cinnamon roll. <laughs> All right. Hopefully everybody's having a good start to their Christmas Eve Thursday as we are going to have some fun in the channel today. <laughs> Bibby says, come on. Uh, sure, I'll hop on that airplane and be there in a couple hours. <laughs> Kevin's card collecting and more is in the house. How you doing there, Kevin? We are actually going to open up with your family mail call. We are going to open up with Kevin's family mail call package first. So let me move this off to the side. That'll be our second item. And then let me move these off to the side. Bibby's part 8 of 12 for his family mail call package. And then again, this one will be the end of the stream when we get to it a little bit later. Um, I haven't decided... No, I'll leave my Fairfield Friday for Fairfield Friday tomorrow. I think I am going to do a live stream, but... I don't know for sure. It'll it'll be between 9 and 10 a.m. in the morning because my wife is working tomorrow, but she'll be home shortly after noon. She only has to go in for a couple hours tomorrow. So that takes care of that. But we got Kevin's package. Oops. I know what I forgot to do here, and I just put that all on camera. Sorry, Kevin. I wasn't thinking. I was so excited to get your package that I forgot to block things off here for both of us. <laughs> I know I already made the mistake, but there's the blue tape to cover up it. <laughs> I'm having one of those days. But Kevin's card collecting. As you can see, this was mailed on the 14th, but I just got it in the mail yesterday. It took nine days for a two-day two day priority box to make it my way. That's mainly because of the Christmas season being upon us. But we are going to have fun opening up this. 
there's going to be an eye-opener card in here that will probably surprise everybody in the channel. Uh, Merry Christmas at Kevin's Car Collecting and more. Good morning. All right. So we are here. Were you watching in the background there, Kevin? And then popped on when I switched off from our lecture to the content for today. So as you can see, the Santa Cam is active. Last chance to get in on the Santa Cam action. And then, oh, I got to finish this. I did a few during the lecture, but I got to finish off my wife's uh, thing that she did in the channel. So... All right, that was 15 more. I did the five during the stream. And that covers what she did earlier in the channel. But I appreciate everybody being here. That's why I had to finish the dinging of the bell. <laughs> All right. Ring for coffee. Of course, we know that's not a full ring for coffee. <laughs> that's uh, I got this a couple years back when we were visiting uh, my mom and stepdad in Vegas. So anybody that knows my bell ringer, that's my hip bell, my hip bell. But we're going to open up Kevin's package first and get into this one. Okay. I like the, the Anginator. <laughs> Life Vantage. It's like a, it almost makes you, make you think maybe it's a subscription box that Kevin sent, but it's not. A, it's just a box he found to use. So we're going to go ahead and open this up and start getting into this family mail call package. Let me bust open the tape here. Slit the bottom here. And I think this should open unless there's some more tape that I missed. Use that. Put that right up there. And let's see what we've got here. Uh-oh, has Kevin got a note in here? Oh, let's see. I didn't think I bought this much. Uh-oh, I want to I wanna hide something there. Here. Uh-oh. Uh so the, these are the ones from the sale there. These are from the sale. This says open in order. Packs one through... Oh, my word. I got some mystery packs in here. I wasn't aware of that. Let me check the note Kevin put in here. Can I read this on, on camera there, Kevin? Or do it, should, I, should I read it first? Uh, let's see. Bibby says my cat is now under the bed after the dings. Oh, sorry there, Bibby. Uh, Chris, Merry Christmas, Donald, Merry Christmas, says Biggie Smalls, 05 White Sox. Uh, Michael Huber, sorry, I'm having to be in and out helping dad get, helping dad get to the bathroom. All the clear bags are from the sale. Okay, yeah, I kind of saw that. I'm going to save that for the end, maybe. It says, uh, da, da, da. Do you want me to read this? Uh, okay, I can read it out loud if I want to. Well, here, I'll, I'll put it in here, and I will read it as I go through here. Um, let me see if I can get it. So, so of course, Kevin puts on there, Christmas 2020 Seattle Mariners. I like how he took so, some of the Seattle Mariner logos and, and incorporated them in here. It says, Donald, Merry Christmas, Donald and Cynthia. What a year this has been. I can't tell you how much yours and Cindy's friendship mean to Ramona and I. It was a blessing to have met you through YouTube and to find so many similar interests was truly an act of God. He has provided us with some great friends in you too. <laughs> Kind of like a play there. In you too. Kind of like YouTube. <laughs> this last summer was one of the most enjoyable vacation trips we've ever taken. And I want to thank you for being such a good host and tour guide. And now I know who the 12th man is. <laughs> I hope you like this token of my appreciation for our friendship. And not only what you've done for me personally, but for the entire YouTube community. 
Uh, there are some things in here that you should find enjoyable and maybe even some funny gag gifts as well. I hope you can find a good use for whatever you may encounter in this box and enjoy its contents. God bless you, my friend, and may his spirit shine from within you. Your friend and brother in Christ, Kevin Duncan. And of course, he's got the other Seattle Mariners notes in the bottom here, the two logos. But thank you, Kevin. Appreciate that very much. Uh, not necessary. I enjoy doing the content that I do on the channel. But we will go through this. I guess he's got seven packs in here. It says, open the packs in order, one through seven. Okay, so we've got a one and a two. Uh-oh. Here, I'll just take them out of the box. How's that? As I go through them. But I'm going to leave this stuff here for the very end. Some things I bought in his sale and a Topps uh, update box that he opened up for me. So we'll go ahead and start this right here for now. Um, let's see. I think he did this to, to Chuck or something the other day, too, so... Just going to kind of put something down here. And we'll go through these. It looks like one at a time. I like how he... <laughs> That's pretty good. He's got these little packing things in here to, to take up the space. That's pretty cool. All right. So let's move this back here and open up pack number one. Uh oh, it looks like a pack of cards in here. Oh, my word. We're going to open up some, vin some vintage cards maybe. <laughs> All right. Oh, my word. So this is pack number one. As per Kevin's instructions, we'll open one pack at a time. This looks like a, uh, I think this is a 1980. I always get confused with these. But, oh, there we go. 1991 score. Oh, my word. I got a Justin Bieber card pack. <laughs> Where did you find these, Kevin? <laughs> oh my word. So we got to we got to open up some Justin Bieber cards. <laughs> oh my word. Well, let's see. This one was in the box first. So let's see what we pull, pull out of this one here. <laughs> I told you this might be fun today. This is a Merry Christmas Eve stream for sure all right so we've got a checklist a checklist oh here let me do it this way to the puzzle there we go the uh stan musual puzzle piece that can go right there into my puzzle piece box and checklist box we got an 88 don russ here so chris james with the phillies uh guy hoffman with the reds there we go lance mccullers with the San Diego Padres. <laughs> Baby Bobka. Kevin, at Kevin's, your package is better than mine. Oh, come on now. <laughs> Don't start fighting there. Oh, there we go. We got a rated rookie, Joey Meyer, in there. Uh, Tom Foley with the uh, Expos. Jose Conseco with the Athletics. Bud Black with the Rangers. Mickey Hatcher with the Dodgers. Dave Winfield. Dave Winfield. I think we got us our first Hall of Famer here. Yep, I got to break out a stand here so we can put these Hall of Famers up, up where they de deserve to go. Okay, so our first Hall of Famer out of the 88 Don Russ. Uh, Bieber. <laughs> uh, Todd Bezinger. He's uh, one of the announcers or does guest appearances on uh, the Seattle Mariners but with the Boston Red Sox. Jeff Robinson with the Tigers. Tom Needenfuhrer with the Orioles. Robin Yelt, Hall of Famer there. There's our second Hall of Famer. Robin Yelt. And then Ivan Calderon, Diamond King, and a checklist card. Got to get a checklist card. Put that with my puzzle pieces there. Let's go into the 1991 score. <laughs> okay. 
Let's see what we get here for the 1991 score product here. I kind of like these cards. Um, so there we go. We got Dave Rigetti with the Yankees. Uh, Mark Langston with the Angels. Uh, Johnny Ray with the Angels. Uh, Lee Gutterman with the Yankees. There we go. We got a 1968 World Series trivia. It says, Mickey stacks the cards. The 1968 World Series was marked by spectacular pitching by Mickey Lolick of the Tigers and Bob Gibson of the Cardinals. Gibson started things off by striking out a record 17 Tigers in Game 1 as he pitched a 5-hit 4 nothing shutout. And Lolick responded in Game 2 with a 6-hit 8-1 victory. After the Cardinals easily won the third game, 7-3, Gibson pitched another 5-hitter to win the fourth game, 10-1. But Lolick pitched the Tigers into a 5-3 win in Game 5, and the Tigers scored 10 runs in the third inning of Game 6 to win easily, 13-1. The series was all tied up. Gibson and Lolick faced each other in Game 7, and neither allowed a run for six innings. Then the Tigers scored three runs in the seventh and went on to win 4-1 to one as Lolick pitched a five-hitter for his third victory in the series. Both pitchers tossed three close games, and both had sparkling 1.65 ERAs. All right, now we got some rookie prospects here. Dave Pavlis with the Cubs. Then we got Mike Bell uh, with the Braves. There we go. We got a first round draft pick for Jeremy Burnett with the Nets. Another rookie prospect here, Mark Lee uh, for the Brewers. Then we got some of our black borders here. Uh, Jeff, Jeff Musselman with the Mets. Lou Whitaker, Lou Whitaker, with the Tigers, Kent Herbeck, Kent Herbeck, all right, Ramon Martinez, Lance Johnson with the White Sox, Jim Eisenreich with the Royals, Roy Smith with the Twins, and, ooh, finishing off with a Craig Biggio. A Biggio with the Astros. I think this is his, dun, 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 dun. this is a third-year card for Craig Biggio. Awesome, awesome there. <laughs> Shane Bieber never looked like that before. All right, so let's see what we can find in this Shane Bieber pack. This might end up somewhere else. <laughs> look look for both rare and foil cards. Ooh, maybe we'll find one of them rare foil, foil cards. And uh, four nine-card puzzles creating mini, post, mini Justin Bieber posters. Oh, my word. I might have to put these in with my puzzle packs. Oh, my word. Let's see what we get for Shane Bieber here. Oh, my word. There we go. I guess you could put these in a sleeve and make a nine-card poster out of it, huh? Okay, so there's part of a J Shane Bieber poster. Uh, or Shane. Not Shane Bieber, Justin Bieber. <laughs> it shows how much I know. Uh, Hobby says buffering. I don't know. I'm not buffering here. But I can see... Any autos in there? I don't know for sure. <laughs> there we go. Justin Bieber. Another Justin Bieber. Oh, wow. Look at that. Another Justin Bieber. Okay. And a Justin Bieber sticker card. And a Justin Bieber. Wow. I wonder how many cards are in this set. Oh, my word. At least 150. Maybe 150, huh? And a 78. And a 93. And a 35. That. Oh, oh, that's so you can get your own Justin Bieber out trading card album. For only $6, you can send off and get one of those cards. Has it got an expiration? It might. This was back from 2010. 
<laughs> well, we'll have to see what we do with this Justin Bieber fever. <laughs> Is that so you can make a sticker? Oh, my word. Well, I thank you, Kevin, for that. Ethan and Kent stay just popping in to say hi and Merry Christmas. Thanks, Sarah, Ethan, for popping in. Appreciate you being here. Let me set these aside off to the side up here. And we'll move on to pack number two. Let's see. I'm going to just play, play with some numbers here. All right, let me set. That's going to keep rolling around. I'm going to set this back in the back here for now for a reason because it's white. Let's see what we've got in pack number two here. Oh, my word. Pack number two. I think we got a pack of... He's been probably saving up some Seattle Mariners for me when he opens up his packs. Oh, my word. Let's see. I wonder if these are all Seattle Mariners cards here. We'll have to see. Let me set leave that team bag aside for now. But we got some Seattle Mariners here. We didn't get any in the first pack, did we? I don't remember seeing any Mariners. But we got a Bill Wilkinson. With the Seattle Mariners. We've got the 2014 record, 87 and 75 Seattle Mariners. John Hicks, rookie card for the Seattle Mariners. Jeff Nelson with the Seattle Mariners, rated rookie. We got Jay Buhner with the Seattle Mariners. Jose Valentin with the Seattle Mariners. Oh, and a Oh, no, this is because of the Cal Ripken Jr. here. All right, that by proxy actually goes in my Cal Ripken Jr. Uh, collection. <laughs> Jose Valentin with the Milwaukee Brewers, but he knew he snuck in that Cal Ripken in there. All right, Dave Valley with the Seattle Mariners. I'm going to be saying Seattle Mariners for every one of these cards. Dennis Powell with the Seattle Mariners. Mark Langston with the Seattle Mariners. Harold Reynolds with the Seattle Mariners. Uh-oh, Fairfield. Fairfield Friday here. Or Fairfield Thursday. Let's see, we had a Fairfield Wednesday yesterday. Got a Fairfield Thursday today. We'll have to see if we get a Fairfield Friday tomorrow. <laughs> I think we will. Um, John Moses. With the Seattle Mariners, Cal Ripken Jr. He's a Baltimore Oriole person, by it. He's my PC. Uh, Lee Gutterman with the Seattle Mariners. Edgar Martinez, Hall of Famer, with the Seattle Mariners. Then we've got a Carter Caps with the Seattle Mariners rookie card. A Steve Balboni with the Seattle Mariners. Boom, there we go. Franchise history, Baltimore Orioles, Cal Ripken Jr., 2131. Then we've got DJ Peterson with the Seattle Mariners, uh, 1984. You didn't take this out of your 84 box, did you? Because you might need this one in your set there, Kevin. Threw, threw you a curveball with that, Ripken. <laughs> yeah, I did. Yeah, you did. Uh, Bill Caldell with the Seattle Mariners. Bill Swift with the Seattle Mariners. Novelli Marte with uh, his first Bowman card with the Seattle Mariners. Floyd Bannister with the Seattle Mariners. And a checklist. Why is the checklist on here? I'll have to look through it, I guess. Well, for now, I don't know for sure why he gave me the checklist. And it's the top 85 checklist. Cards number 1 through 132. Uh, let me look down through here. So if this is 85, I still see Phil. I see, I see Cal Ripken in there, number 30. But I'll throw that in my checklist. Uh, Dick Drago. With the Mariners, Darnell Coles with the Mariners, Harold Reynolds with the Mariners, 
David Valley with the Mariners, Alvin Davis with the Mariners, Matt Young with the Mariners, Edwin Diaz with the Mariners, Scott Bankhead with the Mariners, Henry Cotto with the Mariners, Scott Bradley with the Mariners, Brian Holman with the Mariners, another Brian Holman with the Mariners, and Scott Bradley with the Mariners. Imagine that. A bunch of Mariners in a pack. Well, I got I got pretty tired saying Seattle Mariners all the time there. But this will go with my team separation for the Seattle Mariners. <laughs> we got some rookie prospects. All right, let's move on to... Um, let me refresh the chat real quick here. Thanks for stopping in there, Ethan. I'm sure you're probably gone by now, but I already did mention him earlier when I saw him. Donald agreed to pay us each a dollar for every time he says Mariners. Oh, yeah, now you say that after I'm done, right? <laughs> I don't know if I can do that. I'm, I'm, I'm on a low budget now. I'm definitely on a low budget now, but let's get into pack number three. He said to do these in order, and there's seven packs. Okay, yeah, I see the next four are kind of small. I see the next four are kind of small. So, uh, we'll, 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 we'll be speeding up in a little bit here. <laughs> Uh-oh, this one's in a team bag, but this one's pack number three of seven. I like how he said he had seven packs. All right, this, this I like the start of the front of this one right here. <laughs> Looks like we got some Cal Ripken Jr. sweetness coming up. Oh, I forgot to ring the bells earlier for those other cards. Cal Ripken Jr. Uh-oh, we got some more Mariners here. Oh, my word. Here we go with the Mariners again. Mike Zanino with the Seattle Mariners. Tim Davis with the Seattle Mariners. Mike Jackson with the Seattle Mariners. <laughs> oh, there we go. And opening day, Seattle Mariners. Uh, there we go. And opening day, 2020, you say Kikuchi. A Russ Swanson, Russ Swan with the Seattle Mariners. Alvin Davis with the Seattle Mariners. Jay Buhner with the Seattle Mariners. You, somebody keeping track of these? That's right. Seven is a divine number there, <laughs> Kevin. Mike Zanino with the Seattle Mariners. Yoshi Hirano with the Seattle Mariners. Gene Segura, yellow. That's a Gene Segura, yellow. That's for sure. It's definitely... Did you spray paint this yet? No, just kidding. That's cool looking. Gene Segura. Felix Hernandez with the Tops update. Yep. Um, uh, Jim Lefebvre with the Seattle Mariners. Ooh, this is a Tiffany card. I was wondering why that one was. Oh, it's not Tiffany. It's not shiny. But it's got the Tiffany colors on the back. Dennis Powell. All right, with the Mariners. Uh, Omar Vizquel with the Mariners. Henry Cotto with the Mariners. Dave Valley with the Mariners. Uh, Chris Bazio with the Mariners. Bill Swift with the Mariners. Jay Buhner with the Mariners. Then we got Jason Donald. Is that a play on words? Jason Donald? What is a Tiffany card, Donald? <laughs> uh, Jason Donald. I guess that must be just for me. I'll put that with my rookie cards back here for uh, the Indians. I think he did it to have some fun in the channel. <laughs> uh, oh, what is a Tiffany card? Those were uh, special cards that Tops did back in the day. And usually they're glossy on the front. And then they're, that it has the bright color like these um, on the back. If you look at some of these tops from this year, look on the back. And the, the, the lighter pink is a little bit different than the, the bright pink like this one. In case you're wondering, that's kind of how that works a little bit. Um, 
So yeah, never trust a guy with a last name that can be a first name. <laughs> Jeffrey Leonard with the Mariners. Uh, Brent Knackert with the Mariners. Cal Ripken, uh, 1990 Don Russ. Cal Ripken, two more Cal Ripkins. All right. Uh, Robert, they are the Diamond X Tiffany Dunks. <laughs> Jay Buner with the Mariners. Uh, Rich Amaral with the Mariners. Bill McGuire with the Mariners. Here we go again. Uh, let me see on there. Ken Griffey Jr. is on this Jack list. I saw Cal on the other one. Uh, Darnell Coles of the Mariners, Domingo Ramos for the Mariners, Scott Bradley with the Mariners, ooh, Mike Zanino rookie card for the Seattle Mariners, Mike Zanini rookie, right, Mike Zanu Zanino, wow, I don't think I have one of his rookie cards, but Ray Quinones with the Mariners and J.P. Crawford with the Mariners, so another awesome pack of more Seattle Mariners that'll go into my Seattle Mariners sort. I'm falling so behind in my Seattle Mariners sorting also. So there's those. Moving on to pack number four. Pack number four. Uh-oh. Sweeter as the days roll by. Oh, my word, I got another one. I got two of these. So it's a, a Fairfield Wednesday with my PC player, Cal Ripken Jr. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Uh-oh, I think this is going to be a bell ringer one. The show, Ken Griffey Jr. on the PlayStation. I think this will go in, into my no number cards for Ken Griffey Jr., <laughs> oh, no, it's the Mariner Moose. The Mariner Moose mascot from 2019. Then we got an Edgar Martinez. I think this is... Oh, I don't think this is his rookie card. 87, what is his rookie card? But Edgar Martinez. Edgar Martinez. Uh-oh, and then the Ken Griffey Jr. wish list. This... Uh, 24, 17, I, I know I got a set of these, so these will go into my Ken Griffey Jr. separation, 6 and 1. Got the wish list, introduction card, uh, to make the majors, to be an all-around player, the field of possibilities, uh, 3,598 career games and 40 or more home runs five times. So this was one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six cards. <laughs> oh no, now you want to see some catch up cards. Uh oh. I, that, that must be a clue. That must be a clue there, huh, Kevin? Catch up cards coming up. Is that what it is? Uh, let's see, this will go into, since that's a solo card here, let me throw that in here with my Mariner's bag here. Oops. With the Mariner's mascot. Okay, moving on to pack number five. And this going to go over here. I think that'll kind of make a match. You'll see what I'm doing when I get done here. This is me adding some Christmas, Christmassy look into the channel because they're white. Me just being silly. All right, this is pack number five that he's got numbered here. Uh, possible PSA submission. <laughs> I don't know about that one. <laughs> uh, might be a 10. Uh, Alvin Davis. Uh, I don't know about that one, Kevin. 
It's got a, it's got a wrinkle there. It's got a crease here. Is that on the outside? Yeah, that's on the outside. Tell you what, I'm going to take it off here. All right. I'm going to put this over here. And uh, I'm going to put this right here. And I'll save this for something else for when I submit it to PSA, okay? <laughs> but thank you for that one. And uh, I'll, I'll make sure I get this sent in my next PSA submissions, okay? That's a BCC G10. Yeah. Uh, let me... Uh, Oh, wait, I got to put it in with my Mariners, too, because it is a Mariner. It is a Mariner, so I'm going to put it right behind the uh, the mascot here so I remember. Okay, don't don't forget, Alvin, I'm going to send you into PSA, and when I get it back, I'm going to send it back to Kevin, okay? <laughs> oh, my word, this is Cal Ripken Jr., Rivals, and Ken Griffey Jr., I know I do not have this card. That is awesome, Kevin. Thank you. This goes into my double bin for uh, Cal Ripken Jr. and Ken Griffey Jr. <laughs> uh, stop by to drop. Oh, Joby One Kenobi to drop by. A thumbs up and wishes and wish you all a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you too, Michael Heath. Hi, Joby One. Merry Christmas to all. All right, that is a nice one there, Kevin. Appreciate that. I like that Cal Ripken Jr., Ken Griffey Jr. Aficionado from Pinnacle. Okay, number six. Number six in the run here. This is like an early Christmas present here. Is that like eight bell rings? <laughs> Nelson Cruz. Uh oh, I got. Oh, it's a triple threads. This is for uh, 2018. Congratulations. You have received a single jumbo relic from 2018 triple thread baseballs. Nelson Cruz. Number nine out of 18 for Nelly. It was nice when we had Nelly with us. But I do have a holdout for all my Mariners. Uh, Serialized cards, memorabilia cards, autograph cards. That will have to be put in that set now. You know what? i got to get another stand here because this one is getting full. And let's see. I'm going to put you right there, Nelson. Nelson Cruz. There, now he's like flashing at you when, when the Santa cam turns on. Don't worry. I'll move you out of the way in a second there. All right, and so this is pack number seven. It almost feels like another top loader with like a relic or something in it. Oh, my word. It's an Edgar Martinez tribute triple relic. A tribute triple relic. Oh, my word. 49 out of 99. Game used memorabilia Hall of Famer Edgar Martinez. Ooh, this got to go into my other separation for my uh, Hall of Famer relics. Aside from the Seattle Mariners, because he's a Hall of Famer. So we got, uh, it looks like two bat relics here and a part of the uniform. I have to fix this here. That's probably how I got it. But wow, too kind there. Uh, oh, wait until you see the other stuff we got to go through still. This is awesome, Kevin. Appreciate that. So let's put Edgar Martinez in front of Nelson Cruz because he's deserving. <laughs> he's a Hall of Famer. I don't know if Nelson Cruz will ever make it to the Hall of Fame, but he was a Mariner for a while. But we'll put Edgar right there. Now you can still see uh, that right there so we went through packs one through seven and there is one more item in the box here and i'll probably hold this for later kevin whenever i do need an extra set of cutting device or if my knife doesn't work 
<laughs> this is pretty neat. Did you find these at a dollar store or something? That that this is just actually very cool. I like that. It's a Friskars baseball cutting device. And it looks like it's kind of uh tippy tippy or round tippy. It says uh says on the back here for uh pointed tip for improved detail cutting. Safety edge blades with safer blade angle pros protect kids while cutting all classroom materials. But it's a Friskars. I remember Friskars back in the day. So that is awesome, Kevin. <laughs> I like these scissors. Another cutting utensil can replace this and give these back to my wife now back in the kitchen and keep this one off to the side here. Because you, you probably see me use these scissors every once in a while. So those can go back downstairs into my wife's kitchen drawer and this will replace. Matter of fact, let me just move it over there right now. Take it out of the packaging here so I can get rid of some more recycle stuff. But uh, I like that. See how well it works. <laughs> Thank you there, Kevin. A new channel cutting utensil. And that takes care of Kevin's box. The first part. Now I gotta go through the stuff I bought in his sale. <laughs> all right. So let's see, actually this one, well, I'll, I'll separate all that stuff out later. Thank you, Kevin, appreciate that. So that's our first part, first part of our family mail call package here. Um, let me see here. I know what this is. Um, let's see. There. I'm going to leave this here for now. That's going to be the very last, because I know what that is. But let's go with this one here from the sale, 1213. And it looks like my update cards and my update cards. So I will be able to um, check this against my list here. And if we end up finishing something before... Um, where did I put that? Oh, that's right. It's underneath the, my sorting tray there. But um, we will see for sure if I want to open up something else or not. But we'll see what we've got here first in the updates that he sent from the sale in 1213. So I think I bought a few cards from him, a Cal Ripken Jr. and a Trevor Hoffman. Okay, so the Cal Ripken Jr. and the Trevor Hoffman, two Hall of Famers, but my Cal Ripken Jr. Let's go through these top update cards. We did get, uh, of course, you get a, some Ronald Acuna Jr. Uh, subset cards. Get two of those, the Twin Bill Killing and the Runaway Leader. Got the number one prospect, Nick Allen, prospect number uh, 13, card number 13. Got some uh, Turkey Red cards, Nolan Ryan, Johnny Bench, Garrett Cole, uh, Brooks Robinson, uh, Javier, Javier Baez with the Cubs, 85 throwback, the Roberto Clemente with the Pirates, Kansas City Royals team card, uh, and then we got some leaders, uh, Zach Greinke with the Astros, JT Riddle with the Pirates, um, just notice that there. Uh, Robinson Cano with the 2011 Home Run Derby. Uh, Kyle Hig Higashioka. Uh, Alex Bregman. Jesus Aguilar. Bo Bichette rookie card, rookie debut card. Michael Fulmer with the Tigers. Uh, Sean Poppin with the Twins rookie card. Alex Verdugo with the Red Sox. Uh, Gabe Spear with the Royals rookie card. Uh, Chesler Cuthbert with the White Sox, um, Nick Trulli, 
Turley with the Pirates. Um, Michael Hermosillo with the Angels. Dario Agrazal with the Tigers. Uh, Jerry Rodriguez with the Indians. Uh, Nico Harner with the Chicago Cubs rookie card and rookie debut card. September 9th, 2019. And then uh, uh, Miles Straw with the Houston Astros. That's some update cards there and some subset cards. So I'll go through those when we're finished here. And this looks like the rest of the update box here. So I will put that there. Let's see what cards we get here. We got uh, Shower Time, Lindor Douses Ramirez. Then we got Cesar Hernandez with the Indians. Ken Griffey Jr. <laughs> There's a check off my Ken Griffey Jr. ringer here. Uh, Francisco Lindor. Ichiro. There we go. Derek Jeter. All of Famers. Miguel Cabrera. Miggy Cabrera. Ryan Howard, home run leader. Um, Jalen Beeks with the Rays. Uh, Battery Bath. Martin receives a cold bath from Bueller. Uh, Pete Alonzo, All Star Game. 2019, uh, Greg Allen with the Indians, uh, Keenan Middleton with the Angels, uh, Jesus Tinoco with the Rockies, rookie card, uh, Clayton Kershaw with the Dodgers, all-star game, Peter Lambert with the Colorado Rockies, Zach Greinke with the Astros, David Ortiz, 2010 Home Run Derby. Joey Votto with the Reds. Um, then we got Jorge Lopez with the Kansas City Royals. Uh, Josh Harrison with the Philadelphia Phillies. Uh, Jose Martinez with the Tampa Bay Rays. Uh, Luis Severino with the New York Yankees. Uh, Mark McGuire, 1999 Home Run Derby. Uh, Julius Chicken with the Twins. Uh, Nolan Arenado with the Colorado Rockies. Uh, 2017 All Star Game. Or, yeah, All Star Game. Uh, Francisco Cervelli with the Marlins. Christian Yelich with the Brewers. Uh, Hunter Renfo with the Rays. Chris Martin with the Braves. Rowdy Tellez with the Blue Jays. Mitch Moreland with the Red Sox. Eric Thames with the Nationals. Uh, Brian Johnson with the Red Sox. Uh, Frank Schwindel with the Tigers. Steve Sisek with the White Sox. Albert Pujols with the Angels, Active Leaders, and Mike, or Kyle Crick, sorry, with the Pittsburgh Pirates. So these are all... For Tops Update, see if I can complete that second set. We'll check when we f when I finish here today. I'll look through and see if I get the cards that I'm missing. It's funny how these cards go every which way. So let me put those there. And the final card from his sale is this guy right here. Not this one, the one that's on the one that's behind it. Donald, now your scissors match the knife with that ball on it. Yeah, they do. <laughs> yeah, they do. Uh, let me put that up here real quick. And you can see I got a matching pair. So I got a ball, a baseball hanging from uh, my knife there. I think, yeah, this was left behind, gave me the ball, the ball, baseball keychain. Kevin gave me the the knife from uh, Leavenworth, and then uh, Kevin gave me also this to match that. I guess I could put it on the ring here, and then it could be dangling here. Just make it a threesome. 
then it might make it a little bit difficult to use the knife and the scissors at the same time. Oh, you're missing two in the update set? Send me an email there, Michael. I can see if I can hook you up there. All right. So reach out to me, Michael. Uh, send me an email. Or if you let me know the two numbers you're looking for, uh, and then I can uh, I can reach out to you and I can get those sent to you if I have them. Don't mind doing that, okay? So, of course, this is the card that Kevin just gave me earlier. Oh, just send, uh, send me an email there, Michael. Um, DonaldBlomdahl at gmail.com. Okay, but thanks there, MRH. 75 heath at gmail.com um yeah if you can just reach out to me first i will and then uh give me in the in the email uh which cards you're looking for yes drum roll <laughs> thanks kevin for keeping me on track uh then let me know what you're hunting for oh okay and i can let you know if i didn't get the rest of the cards i'm looking for to complete my third set i already gave one set away and that's i was hoping i could do this before my december giveaway uh hint hint <laughs> but uh so here we go uh cal ripkin jr rivals and ken griffey jr was the card but the one i'm going to show you next is right underneath here you guys tell me if some of, besides Kevin, he already knows what it is. Tell me who you think this might be. Of course, it's kind of hard seeing him from behind, huh? Any idea who this might be? I think pretty soon you're going to see... Very nice. Boom. Kyle Lewis. Uh, I don't think the helmet's the right color. But that would have been a nice one, too. Let's see. Should be able to see at least the name coming up. Bernard Gilkey. <laughs> no, it's a Mike Trout. It's a unique, special 2020 Tops Update Mike Trout with the Angels. One special card that Kevin pulled on a channel. His channel. It is the 2020 Tops Update U4. I guess just so you can see it better if it if it shows up if I get close enough. Let's see if you can uh see the the number on it on the bottom here on the code. That is a very nice card. Yes, and it is a 632 which makes it, it is an SSP, a super short print Mike Trout. So thank you, Kevin. I could not believe it when you pulled that and somebody said, oh, that's that's the short print. And I was like, oh, that's pretty cool to get a short print trout. But then come to find out it ended up being the super short print trout, which from what people were telling me is it's probably like a couple hundred dollar card. So that was an awesome card that you pulled on your channel there, Kevin. And that's what's going to get highlighted in the back here for the rest of this stream. Along with, uh, let's see, let me put these guys here. That's my checklist there. I'll find home for them. This is some, some rookie cards. Some from some of the other packs that you sent me. These are some... That was the packs of cards that you sent me. This is the update cards. And the super short print that you pulled for me, Kevin. The trout. These are some two nice relic cards that Kevin gave me for Christmas presents. The Edgar Martinez. 
and the Nelson Cruz. That was an awesome uh, it has sold on eBay for $350, the trout, uh, along with the Alvin Davis. I'll send it to PSA. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I would think about that, but it's so expensive. And I've heard some some different things about PSA. So uh, I'm not really a PSA person to send submissions in. Plus, you got to be able to afford to do things like that. Um, so I'll just probably leave it that way and see. I mean, best case scenario, because I'm not really a trout collector, per se. I would probably, uh, I would maybe list it on eBay and see if I can sell it. But uh, we'll see what I end up doing with that in the not so distant future. All right. So, other than that, got these cards here. We're going to move into, um, for now, I'm going to hold off on the Stadium Club. Just because if if I end up completing this next set, I might, uh, I might do some, uh, some break, sell breaks on my channel a little bit. I might start doing something like that as an interim. Not to 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 go overboard in things, but we will see what happens there. But we're going to go ahead and get into Bibby's part 8 of 12 to continue in the family mail call part for this stream here. And uh, we'll see. We might still do... Uh, we might still do this one here. All right. But we're going to do Bibby's package for now. And we'll take it from there, depending on what we see out of Bibby's package here. Uh, <laughs> congratulations again, Donald. That was an awesome pull, and I'm so glad you got it. Oh, yeah, I know. We were wondering if this package was ever going to show up or something was going to happen to it. But it did show up, and I appreciate that, Kevin. I was wondering why you put everything in a priority box. And now I see how you threw things together. Uh, so let's see what we've got in Bibby's part 8 of 12 here. I see uh, Jim Rice on the back here. But let's see what we've got in Kevin's, or in, in Bibby's package here. So we got uh, Jose Canseco, Jim Rice, and Kirby Puckett. Boom, Cal Ripken Jr. Uh, let me put the Cal Ripken Jr. up here with my my Ken Griffey Juniors and Cal Rip my Hall of Famers up here. Those Hall of Famers. All right, then we've got uh, here we go, the uh, eighty-three Jim Rice. There you go, Kevin. Look at that Tony Gwynn there. Tony Gwynn. All right. Uh, Aaron Savannah, Tristar Obak. What is this one? Tristar Obak, factory number 10, 1st District, Texas. Baseball series from, selected from Game Changers. Hmm. I don't think I've ever seen this product. Tristar Obak. There we got a strawberry, an Andre Dawson, uh, Dale Murphy, Roger Clemens, Tim Raines, Johnny Bench, Cummings Curveball. Oh, that one's a different one. Oback Tristar. Hmm. Uh, is that John McGraw, Connie Mack, Ruby Foster? Awesome there, Ruby. Uh, Bocally. Uh, Tinker, Evers, and Chance. Baseball's sad lexicon. <laughs> Collect Oback. Uh, that Matt, Ray Chapman. There we go with a Jose Canseco. Jose Canseco. Another Jose Canseco. Jose Canseco. Wade Boggs. Hall of Famer. 
Pedro Martinez, Roy Holiday, Don, Chasing Donnie Baseball, Don Mattingly, uh, Pedro Martinez, Goodwin Champions, Pud Galvin, Sam Thompson, Carlton Fisk, that's a cool looking Carlton Fisk, 2012 Goodwin Champions, Wade Boggs, that's a little cutouts, pop ups, turns into a little box and then you can stand it up if you do want to break it out of its uh, flat form. Uh, Pedro Martinez, a little sparkly card for back in the day. This was back in uh, 1999. Roy Holiday, Don Mattingly, uh, Pedro Martinez, Jim Rice. Ooh, Jim Rice. Uh, this must be a, a what do they call them? The re reclaimed ones. Reclaimed. Oh, there you go. The original with the 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 special stamp on it. Oh, shoebox collection. Shoebox collection. Shoebox collection is like a project that uh, Cooperstown is working on, isn't it? That is a cool card. I like that one. That Jim Rice. Another Jim Rice, the 84, uh, from the 2012 reprint. 84 Jim Rice. Jim Rice. Jim. Oh, there. Whoa, my word. There we go. We got a quad. A quad Jim Rice here. We went from doubles to triples to quads. <laughs> And then last but not least, a Jim Rice from 2008 Don Russ. Awesome cards there, Bibby. I just can't believe, I, I don't know where you find all these cards. My word. It's just like totally mind boggling to me. You're at, By the time we're done here, you'll probably double if not more more than double my hall of fame collection here oh, hold on let me uh unpeel this here it's easier then to pull things out here for this next stack i definitely got her after after this week with bibby i definitely gotta empty out my recycle bin <laughs> i definitely have to uh, empty out my recycle bin. Uh, it's definitely been filling up this week. Uh, Jackie Robinson with the Brooklyn Dodgers. Uh, Bob Gibson, uh, 2008 Threads. Steve Carlton. Tony Gwynn. Wow, you've seen that one before, Kevin? 2008 Threads, Tony Gwynn. Robin Yelt. Tim Raines. Uh, oh, look at that Tony, Tony Gwynn there, Kevin. National Pack Time. Uh, Don Mattingly chasing Donnie Baseball. There we go, Roy Holiday. Another Roy Holiday. Boom, Cal Ripken Jr., Iron and Steel. Another Cal Ripken Jr. there. Put that one aside. All right, then we got a uh, Pedro Martinez, Don Mattingly, Roy Holiday. We've been getting a lot of Roy Holidays and Pedro Martinez's lately. At least I'm definitely building up my Pedro Martinez collection and Roy Holiday. I don't think I have a whole lot of Roy Holiday cards. Pedro Martinez, Tony Gwynn, Roy Holiday, Pedro Martinez, Adrian Beltre, Wade Boggs. Uh, Wade Boggs again, Tampa Day Devil Rays checklist, Ryan Sandberg, uh, Francisco Lindor, some Topps Gallery coming up, it looks like. Ooh, and some Master Apprentices coming up, too. So Francisco Lindor, Jose Altuve, Joey Votto, Noah Syndergaard, Yadier Molina, Paul Goldschmidt, Ooh, Topps Gallery Heritage card. Oh, these are these are heritages, aren't they? 
Yeah, they are. They're the heritage style tops gallery. Interesting. Uh, Javier Baez, Buster Posey, Juan Soto. Ooh, here comes some Hall of Fame cards. Top ga tops uh, gallery from what is this year? Two oh, last year, two thousand nineteen. Insert cards, I think. H O F G seventeen. Well, we got Johnny Bench there, Mel Ott, Stan Musial, Christy Mathewson, Ted Williams, Hank Aaron. Then we've got more of the Heritage, uh, Blake Snell. Boom. Then we got the Master and Apprentice. What's this one? This is Ted Williams and Mookie Betts. This is uh, Manny Machado and Fernando Tatis. Um, let's see. That looks like Hank Aaron and... Uh, Ronald Acuna Jr. Uh, oh, look at that. Babe Ruth and Aaron Judge. There we go. Los Angeles Dodgers, Master and Apprentice. Sandy Koufax and Clayton Kershaw. Master and Apprentice. Stan Musial and Paul Goldschmidt. Uh, Master and Apprentice, uh, looks like Tony Gwynn and Manny Machado. And then Master and Apprentice, oh, Robin Yount and Christian Yelich. And Master and Apprentice, Frank Thomas and Eloy Jimenez. Awesome cards, Bibby. Wow. This is just. Like Bibby has said, this is the gift that keeps giving. That's the whole set. The whole set of what, Kevin? <laughs> that Koufax and Kershaw is sweet. Thanks, there, Michael. But this is this is just the love in the channel that I receive is just phenomenal. I mean, it's just a blessing and a half sometimes. So let's just do this one more item here. And then I've got so many other things to do. Oh, my word. Oh, my word. Every day I do something on the channel, it gives me just that much more work to do. <laughs> in the background, that's for sure. Well, let's see. Let's see if I can break in my new my new scissors here to, to bust open this box here. We'll bust open this box. I'll edit the title to take off the uh, Top Stadium Club. I'm just going to open up this since I do have two more of these after I open up this one. But we'll see what happens here. See what we get in this uh, Topps Baseball Pack. Again, I just got these in the day before yesterday. And yesterday I opened up box number one. Oh, you think it might be the whole master and apprentice set i don't know for sure on that one but you never know it could be there we go we got alan trammell on the top here i don't think we got any relics in this one but we will go through and see what we pull out of this box let me just set that right up here for now as we go through these cards it is sealed by tops so they are sealed packs I will undo this seal here, and let's see what we pull in this Super 70s Sports. Okay, let me set this off to the side here. Let me uh, precursor it and just lift the top off here real quick. Oh, come on. Oh, there it goes. I was trying to tap the card out without doing too much. Let me get a sip of water real quick here. All right. So let's go ahead and go through this really quick. We'll pull these cards out here. 
and go through them one by one and see what we can get in this second pack of the 70s. Super 70s Sports Baseball includes one pack, 20 cards per pack, Major League Baseball, and look for autographs. I think yesterday when Dragon Fan Tim was here, he said, in these, it's one, a one out of three chance of getting an autograph. Well, in our first box yesterday, we did get an autograph. And I'm pretty sure it was a Hall of Fame autograph that I remember. But let's see how we do in pack number two. So we got Alan Trammell for the Detroit Tigers to lead off. Boom. Then we got a Mookie Betts. We got a Mookie Betts here, outfielder for the Dodgers. Boom, Ted Williams, Hall of Famer with the uh, Boston Red Sox. Cody Bellinger with the Los Angeles Dodgers. Boom, Hank Aaron for the Atlanta Braves. Pretty sure that's when he was with the Atlanta Braves. Still back. Yep, Atlanta Braves outfielder back in the day. Boom, Matt Olson, first baseman for the Oakland A's. Matt Olson. Uh, let's see. Bibby, uh, at Donald, where can I get custom breaker mat made for the Bibby break room? Breakdown. Um <laughs> Um, I don't know. You can look online. I made this one with uh, my label down here, my sticker that I have that I put on my packages when I, when I mail them out and stuff. So, I mean, I just got an oversized break, uh, a mouse pad that covers my whole table. And then I just kind of uh, decorate it myself. All you have to do is uh, have a logo made, Bibby. Uh, for your channel and stuff and then it can be either a sticker or you can get them printed on there They get kind of pricey. So with me being on a retiree budget, I kind of uh, go the cheap route. So I just I'll probably have to repair the the tape here. You can see it peeling off a little bit there But then this here. Yeah, this is just a sticker my stickers that I did I go through uh um, I'm trying to remember. I'll, I'll talk to you later, Bibby. And uh, can uh, I think it's Sticker Mule? It's, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the company I get my stickers from. My my holographic stickers. And then uh, this here I just made. I printed it out on my printer and then put, put it on a piece of tape and put it on here. Pretty soon I'll have to change it. It's It's getting peeled up here and on the edges. So it's not a professional mat by any means, that's for sure. But I know there are places out there you can get them made. I know you're looking at maybe premiering your channel next year sometime, early next year, I think. But I don't want to spoil any of your fun. But, uh, but yeah, uh, that's all I would say is just shop around and see where you can get them custom made if you do want to do that. Um, but yeah, we can talk on the phone later about that one. I can give you a little bit more information. I can look up my uh, the information on where I order the, the stickers for my channel and stuff. All right, so Matt Olson, first baseman for the A's. Oh, there we go. Gary Carter, Hall of Famer with the Montreal Expos catcher. Uh, Ryan Sandberg with the Chicago Cubs. Inked Gaming uh, does custom mats. Okay, there you go. You can look up that there from Matty G. Inked Gaming. Is that like inkgaming.com or something there, Matty G? Just kind of curious. But we've got seven people watching. We got 11 thumbs up. Didn't get quite up to my 20 thumbs up, but that's okay. Ryan Sandberg with the Chicago Cubs. Boom, there we go. Willie Mays with the with the San Francisco Giants. Outfielder. And we got next one, Bryce Harper. That's a nice Bryce Harper there. Bryce Harper with the Philadelphia Phillies. 
then Francisco Lindor with the Cleveland Indians shortstop, Albert Pujols, Albert Pujols, uh, designated hitter and first baseman for the Angels. Steve Carlton with the Philadelphia Phillies. Watched him growing up as a kid, pitching for the Philadelphia Phillies. Hall of Famer. Eric Davis, Cincinnati Reds outfielder. Um, Garrett Cole, pitcher for the New York Yankees. Garrett Cole. Burt Blylevin, Hall of Famer. All right, Hall of Famer for the Texas Rangers. Back in the day, old-timer for sure, Dave Kingman. Dave Kingman. All right, with the Chicago Cubs. Justin Verlander with the Houston Astros. Then I think we got our insert cards in the back here. We got uh, Magnificent must Mustaches, uh, Gorman Thomas with the Milwaukee Brewers, and another Miss <laughs> Magnificent Mustaches with the Wade Boggs Hall of Famer with the Tampa Bay Devil Rays. All right, Tampa Bay Devil Rays. Cool, so no auto in that pack there, but still good cards nonetheless. Alan Trammell, Mookie Betts, Ted Williams, Cody Bellinger, and Aaron, Matt Olson, Gary Carter, Ryan Sandberg, Willie Mays, Bryce Harper, Lindor, Pujols, Carlton, Davis, Cole, Blylevin, Kingman, and Verlander. Gorman Thomas for... So let's see, we got Magnificent Mustache number two and five. And then we got these base cards out of this uh, pack here. Let me just put them in order real quick. 31, 3, uh, 75, 37, 49, uh, 79, 72, uh, 69, 56, 48, um, 10, uh, 87, we got 12 here. And a five, and a fifty-one, and eighteen, and last one is a twenty-six. Oh, hold on, what do we got? Oh, no, forty-eight, twenty-six. I think right there. Real quick, short sort there. The photos on the cards I've never seen used before on a card must have been in Topps photo files. Uh, it could be there. This is these are from Topps directly there. Uh, these are some of their products that they've been making this this year. Um, I've been a Topps Topps member for a long time uh, through the years and stuff, and so I uh, especially this year I've gotten so many uh, texts and updates. Uh, well, I'm out for today. See you all later. All right there, Michael Heath. You take care. Appreciate you being here. But I uh, got these in order. I'll match these up with my other set and see what we've got all around. So uh, let me get these in the back here. Do a reverse order here on these guys. Just so you can see the cards one last time before I put them back in the box. And we will see how close I get after opening all four boxes of getting a complete set. I, I know I'll be short because I only bought four boxes. I kind of wish now I would have bought more, but maybe I can find the individual cards 
on the Topps uh, baseball card site. So that takes care of that box there. And I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up for today. So as soon as I do get off the stream here, I will be taking care of some things. Uh, I got to do some some chores around the house, preparing for the Christmas holidays here coming up and getting things ready. Um, I will probably do a live stream tomorrow. Tomorrow is my Hall of Fame Friday, and I will probably do a Fairfield Friday. That'll probably be my short content. I'll do a live stream, and then I'll probably put up some live content sometime throughout the day, either of my Christmas village, uh, our Christmas tree. Um, might even go outside and uh, do a little bit of a, might go through our neighborhood and do a, a live video um, kind of going through our uh, lights of Christmas through our neighborhood. But uh, everybody, you all take care. Merry Christmas, Donald and everyone. Uh, God bless you all and goodbye. All right, Kevin, you take care. Appreciate you being in here, Michael Heath. Uh, Merry Christmas to you too, Bibby Bobka, uh, Maddie G., um, everybody that's been watching today, I appreciate everybody. Let me get my, uh, Santa Claus hat on. Do my signature sign off as we get ready to, to rock and roll here in just a minute and finish up for the day's activities. All right. So let me turn my camera around real quick. This has been Donald Blomdahl. Yep. Let me put it over here so you can see my little Santa hat better. <laughs> this has been Donald Blomdahl, Hall of Fame veteran, sports cards and collectibles, having been live to you from Arlington, Washington, for this installment this uh, Thursday with our continuing lessons of uh, play ball. We've got 24 lectures to go through. This was number 15, so we've got nine more to go. And then we'll finish off this series, and I'll start a new series for uh, Thursdays. No, yeah, Thursdays. Today is Thursday. My, this week has flown through. But, um, so yeah, until then, you all have a great and wonderful day. I will turn the camera around and get ready to say goodbye and my final shout-out. So, again, I'm wearing my Santa shirt, my Santa cap, and just... Uh, getting ready to have some fun this Christmas Eve. Um, I think my daughter will be going to uh, a, our pastor's son and daughter-in-law's house. They always have Christmas Eve together there. Uh, she's really close to their family, and she, they, they uh, do their gift exchanges then. But um, other than that, it'll be me and the wife home tonight. I may record some some more videos from my Christmas village or something of that nature uh, this evening also but just so you all know you all have a great fun and safe Merry Christmas and uh, I'm sure I'll see you guys around the channels guys and gals uh, you all around the channels um, so until then have a great and wonderful Christmas Eve and hopefully we'll see you tomorrow morning I might go a little bit earlier, 9.30, just to get the stream out of the way. i got to help my uh, daughter uh, get Christmas dinner to together for tomorrow afternoon when we have just uh, my niece and her mom and her fiancé over. So it'll just be six of us for Christmas tomorrow. But, um, you know, with what's going on in the world today, we just got to keep the group small. Uh, I know everybody has their own way of celebrating, but... Have a great and wonderful Christmas Eve, and we will see you all then. Merry Christmas, and have a Happy New Year also coming up in 2021. So let me turn the camera around. We'll get ready to sign off here. You can see the Santa Cam one last time. And all the cards we went through and highlighted today. So until then, have a great and wonderful day. I appreciate everybody that was in here today and just have a very Merry Christmas to you and your family. And again, if those that can make it in tomorrow, it will not be a long stream at all. We're going to do our Pasios. Uh, Luis Arpacio. 
is our Hall of Famer will be done tomorrow. Okay, Luis Arapat. Aparicio, I think, is, is is exactly how you say his name, Aparicio. But until then, have a great, wonderful day, and we will see you around the channels. Bye now.